Pastor Kevin, you were the first one to spin the wheel for our Unbelievable Summer Series videos. And all you gotta do, just push this button. All right, I'm so excited. Okay, let's see. Whatever it lands on is what you will have to experience in every other pass. I'm gonna win a prize. No, you're not, but you're gonna spice things up. No, no, it's on uh, fast and furious. A little bit of speed. Yeah, so what yes. you're gonna do is you have to challenge two other people to a go-kart race that's gonna be epic. A go-kart race. The family guys, Jeff McLean, our associate pastor, youth guy, and Nate Bartlett, the new guy, the children's. I will leave them in my dust. I will smoke them away. I will go really fast. Okay, well, let's go. Okay, for week one, I have the go-kart race. We're here, and I'm here with Pastor Kevin and Pastor Nate over there, but we're missing someone. Where is Jeff? Jeff McLean, he is supposed to be right there. Uh, do you guys know where he is? Okay, are you ready for the race, though, while we wait for him here? Oh, unbelievably ready. Yep. Oh, I hear something. Is it the go-kart? I don't hear a go-kart. Oh, no, what does he think he's doing? <laughs> okay, this isn't gonna work. We can't have this thing going against these two carts because they have the advantage. There's no way he's gonna handle that thing on this course. Wow. Uh, get that thing off this course and let's get a cart for him. Okay guys, you just experienced something unbelievable. You played, did some awesome go-karts, and I now get to present the winner, which is Nate. Yes! Oh, come on. He cheated. He <laughs> cheated? You cheated. You ran me off the track. Oh. He shouldn't have that. That's mine. Oh, well, unbelievable. You didn't win. He was Bro. disqualified, so he just wins by default. You think you, okay. Whoever you think wins, you guys can be the judges. Uh, but I think Pastor Kevin's just going to take this 
for a win. But if you guys are looking for something real fun to do, we just want to thank uh, Speedway membership for putting these carts here together for us. And you can check them out. And uh, yeah, when we're that. not here, it's a great family friendly environment. And so, hey, <laughs> we'd love to see you here sometime. Well, there are lots of unbelievable things happen around here. I was sure that that thing was scripted so that I would win, but uh, they drove me off the course. Unbelievable, right? Uh, just no good at all. There are many unbelievable things. There was some unbelievable hot weather already this summer and some unbelievably cold weather already this summer. Lots of unbelievable things. But, but as you think about some of the... Uh, unbelievable good and bad things, uh, just be reminded that as little children, we loved that which was unbelievable. Uh, there, there's the regular fantasies and characters of our childhood that would have special gifts or do special things. Or in my wife's family, she had a couple of uh, things that I had never heard of. And so I had discovered the birthday uh, band after all the Christmas sales were over and uh, she would bring out uh, uh, things. And so that always landed wherever the Christmas tree was up in, in the house. So she had some weird and wonderful traditions, that kind of stuff. But, but I loved it. I love kind of the little fantasy of imagination. Uh, when I was in children's ministry, we had the birthday boxer, which would come out and celebrate kids' uh, birthdays. Um, Rocky music playing in the background. He'd come out and he'd do this little dance and give presents. And, and kids love it. I love it. But at some point, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what's the difference between all these made-up characters these people that, that, that are bigger than life and the living God. Well, what's the difference and how do we know if all these other things are part of our imaginations, uh, part of fiction and fantasy? Well, what about God? I mean, after all, we all kind of have this attraction to fiction and fantasy. It's why we read books and go to movies and watch TV shows and make crazy videos. We, we love the unbelievable and we love to dive into those things. But then we get a little more serious and we start to question God, this living and everlasting God. If there even is a God, how would you imagine him to be? What would he be like to you? How do you picture him? Maybe like the cartoons that we grew up with, with a, a good guy on this shoulder and a bad guy on that shoulder, and they would argue and fight, and, and they would kind of, and, and maybe this was God and the devil with his little red horns, and, and there'd be this, this, this fight back and forth. Is there even a battle that goes on, a battle for right and wrong, or is that all part of our imagination as, as well? I mean, almost everyone, if you think about it, can agree that certain things are wrong. It's wrong for us to drop kick a little old lady who's just minding her own business, right? We would all say, no, that's wrong. You, you can't do that. Or or to kill a man for the color of his skin. We would all say it's, it's wrong for a pedophile to abuse children, for a man to assault his wife, or for a pastor to lie, cheat, and steal. There, there are certain things that, that just intrinsically inside us we know is just wrong. And if there is a wrong, is there not also a right? And if there is a right... Where does that right come from? Is God real? How can I know that there is a God? And how can I explain to others? Well, welcome to week number one of our unbelievable summer, where all summer long, I'm going to help you truly begin to believe for the unbelievable, or what some people would 
find terribly hard to believe. I want to especially welcome those of you that are in Bathers today at our Bathers site, the Chatham site. Welcome to you folks. If you're joining us online or if you're right here live at the Newcastle site, I want to thank you for being with us and I hope you'll be with us all summer. I've tried to remove every excuse for being away uh, any of these Sundays this summer, but if I did miss something and you come up with your own excuse, you be sure and join us online at the Point Church dot ca get all caught up the questions and answers that i hope to present this summer i hope these are truly helpful days for you and so thank you again for being with us uh, some of those excuses maybe uh, you like to sleep in well then you go to bathurst or chatham or right here at 11 o'clock you don't want to miss the whole day so sleep in and then get to one of the sites if you're traveling get to the closest site if you're an early bird want to prioritize getting to church and and then get on with your day get here in newcastle to our 9 30 service and uh, just make those things a priority you can know too when you get out of here you get a treat at the door on your way out that I got to pay for with my own money and so uh, I am sure that even if I'm halfway through the sermon I'm getting you out of here uh, with our one hour guarantee those of you that are more spiritual can stick around behind and I'll finish up the sermon uh, but the rest of you are free to go right on time right uh, but we want to make sure that we get that we're turning down the temperature so just like when you go to a restaurant some of you that are cold, uh, you bring yourself a sweater. It is far better for you to put a layer on than me to take off any layers, right? <laughs> so you make sure that uh, you come ready. We're doing everything we can to uh, make sure you're ready for this summer. But, but right now, as we get into this whole unbelievable summer together, as we start looking at these questions, I want to look at this first question, is God real? Is he real? And how can I know for sure? And how can I explain to people? I mean, there are people that really find it hard to believe that there is a God, that there's anything more than, than what we see in front of us. I often remind people probably at a, at a time when it's least necessary at funerals, I will sometimes quote uh, Solomon, who wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that the God has set eternity on the human heart, that he has written eternity on our hearts. We know on some level, and it's especially clear at a, at a funeral, that there must be something more. We don't just get up and go to work and come home and go to bed and do it all over again until we reach the next level, until we get to retirement, until we get to the grave. There's, there's got to be something more. There's something inside us that just tells us that. And yet we can't see or feel or touch this living God. And so how do we know that that he's any different than these other characters that we make up. There, there's something in us that says there must be something more. In John chapter 4, verse 24, we, we learn that God is spirit. That, that, that he is acknowledged as being invisible. That, that we cannot touch the living God. That he is spirit, that he's invisible. And so it gets pretty hard to prove that he exists or that he doesn't. If we can't see him, how can we know that he is real? How can we know that there is a God? I think there's at least three ways that I want to present to you today just quickly that'll help you to know, to help you remember, but will also help you to explain to others that there is a living God, there has just got to be. And the, the first thing that we look at is in Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul pens these words. And if you think about it, if you let this sink in, each of these three things, you'll start to realize there has got to be a God. Romans 1.20 says, For since the very beginning of time, as we understand it, since creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, 
What are his invisible qualities? His eternal power and his divine nature, since the beginning of time, they have been clearly seen. How have they been clearly seen when we've got people all around denying the existence of God? Well, they've been clearly seen and understood from what has been made. So that people are without excuse. So see, the first way that, they, that, that we know there must be a God is creation, the complexity of all that we see around us. See, when I jump in my Jeep in the summertime and I've got the doors off and the roof off and the wind is flowing through my wavy hair, as that's all happening and I reach down and turn on my radio, I don't say, wow, isn't it great that the winds have just blown the right way and the right things together, that, that given enough time, this machine has just come together and I get to enjoy it? No. When, when I go to turn on that radio, when I get to, to experience that ride, I know that somebody manufactured this. Somebody made this. Somebody worked hard to get this. And when I look at creation, when I think about how a baby is formed and how uh, he grows, when, when we look at, at a leaf or an animal or, or so many different complexities, well, for me, for me at least, I, I think, well, wow, something had to make this. Now, we're, we're all intelligent people, and there are doctors and philosophers and plumbers and teachers and professors who, who believe in creation the way creation is described in the pages of Scripture. There are many of them, but there are many who don't. There are many who say this is, that that couldn't be, and so they subscribe to the, the Big Bang Theory, or they subscribe to, to this way of, of creation or another. But, but if you keep tracing it back, if you keep going back a step further and a step further, you say, well, who created the argue and twist things long enough? If you look at enough pages on the internet, you'll find exactly what you're looking for. If you don't want to find the living God and you want to find proof that he does not exist, let me promise you, there's lots of people that will lie and cover up and they've got good reason to do it. I've got good reason to teach you that there is a God. I've got a vested interest in that, right? Such a vested interest because I'm raising my family to believe that there is a God. I could have done other uh, forms of work. I could have done other things, but, but I really believe in the hope that I present to you today. See, there is a living God, and one of the ways that I know he's real is I look at the complexities of what he has made, what he has done. But that's, that's not the only thing. I also uh, know that we can know there is a God because of something I alluded to a few minutes ago. This morality meter, this knowledge of right from wrong. Even without a Bible or without a preacher, there's something internally that tells us that there's, there's something right and there's something wrong with certain things. Here's just a page later, the Apostle Paul writes this, indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, when those who had no Bible, when those who had no preachers, when they do by nature what comes natural to them, when they do by nature the things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. I mean, what that means is there's something more in us that would tell us right from wrong. And where does that come from? If there is certain things that are wrong, logically there must be certain things that are right. And there must be some way or someone who has put inside of us this morality meter. And so 
when I think about, is God real? How can I explain to somebody about the reality of God? I think, wow, since the beginning of time, it's been made clear. If you want to believe, there's lots to look at. There's lots of evidence about the complexity of our creator. Just look at the complexity of his creation. But the second thing is this internal instinct that that there are certain things that are right and wrong. And if there is no God, where did that all come from? There is a God, and we can know him. Then the third thing that stands out to me uh, is the historical evidence that there is a God. I, I don't mean the historical evidence that there was a man named Jesus who lived and died. It would be crazy for me to argue that. Right? There actually are people who have spent too much time on conspiracy theory websites that say, oh, we think that maybe Jesus was just an idea. You can look way beyond the pages of Scripture and you can find all sorts of evidence. In fact, there is more evidence that Jesus lived and died than there is that I'm here today. So we know that Jesus lived and died. What we don't know or what some find unbelievably hard to believe is is he is he who he said he was? Is he the living God? Was he God with skin on? Was he uh, God? Is he really God? In John chapter uh, 13, well, actually even before that, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, 13, we see a different sort of historical evidence that there is a God. Now, not just that Jesus lived and that he died, not just the claims of Jesus, which I believe, but, but how do I know that there is a God? Because I look at the historical data of what God has done in our world. Sure, that's hard to, to pinpoint for sure beyond the shadow of a doubt. But when I look at what he's done in my life, how I've experienced God, things begin to change a little bit. Look at what the Apostle Paul again writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. At the end of a whole discourse on love and how warm and fuzzy and real love is, he goes on to say, and now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. See, the historical data in my life is I pointed my faith in a certain direction. I pointed it toward believing God. And as I pointed in that direction in the same way, is every one of you believe that um, I've got something in my pocket, right? And it's a, it, you might believe it's a $100 bill or you might believe it's a credit card, but, but you cannot see what I've got in my pocket. You have to have faith to believe for what you cannot see. I have faith to believe for what I cannot see. I believe in a living God. I point at my faith there, and then I've seen evidence of it. But it's not just faith. It's also hope. The hope that God has given me, it's historical. I've had horrifying announcements made to me. I've had horrible things happen. Some would consider tragic things. But, but in the midst of that, to be able to, to point your hope towards Someone who's in charge. Someone who's going to bring all things together for good. I would not change that hope for anything. And history teaches me in my life that hope overcomes. That hope really helps and, and love. And, and the greatest of the, this historical data is, is love. Look at what John writes. By this, by love Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, the truth is, you can't win an argument um, with words about is God real. But you can show people that God is real by the power of faith, hope, and love. Real love. To be able to to show love and acceptance and forgiveness when it seems impossible. That says there, there is a God, that he is real. Amen. The complexity of creation 
says to me, there is a God. The internal right versus wrong morality meter says there is a God. The historical data for me says, yes, there is a God. If the unbeliever is wrong, well, what has he lost? I think he's lost quite a bit. If the unbeliever is right, what has he gained? Bragging rights? I was right. But there's no life hereafter, according to him, so who's he going to brag to? If we're wrong, if, if I'm wrong, what have I lost? Nothing. I've had a better life. I've had faith and hope, and, and I just disappear into nothingness anyhow, so what, what, what am I short? See, some people would say there is no God because they've had a bad church experience, or they're mad at God, or he's disappointed them, or he hasn't lived up to what they expected him to be or to do. But, but if they would believe, they could gain everything. See, just because we have a bad God experience doesn't mean he doesn't exist. See, I believe in love, even romantic love. But sometimes people get love wrong. You just ask my wife. She'll tell you, sometimes we get love wrong. Sometimes we get love terribly wrong. But it doesn't mean that love doesn't exist. Listen to me for a second. Just because some people in your life have gotten God terribly wrong, that they think it's all about a bunch of rules and rituals and things that just don't matter, that it's about a religion, just because people get God wrong doesn't mean he doesn't exist any more than just because people get love wrong doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There is a living God. He is real. And he loves you enough for you to love others, for you to have faith and for you to experience hope. Let's pray. Father God, in this moment, we thank you that you are the real, everlasting God, that you give us faith, that you give us hope, and that you give us love. And this day, we pray that you would just continue to remind us that you are good, that you are God. And we thank you that we can believe in the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.